Greetings everyone and welcome back to the channel. Today we are going to be answering viewer questions and comments. Actually, it is a question from our viewers out there. But before we get into whatever that question is and what the answer may be, please make sure to like, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and add yourself a comment to this video or any of the other videos that I have because comments is where we get to interact and you never know, you might find yourself getting an answer to your question via your own personalized video, just like today. So let's jump into the computer now that that's out of the way. In the, today's episode, we're gonna look at uh, this port forwarding reverse shells video. Underneath there, someone made a question, right? They had a, they had a question. Help me, they say. Don't understand something. Maybe you could elucidate. And it is from Jacob Riley. And Jacob Riley asks, I know I'm very late to this and also very new, but how did you know which payload to pick? Well, in this video, right, I was doing this uh, port forwarding of a reverse shell, okay. accessing some target out in the internet, and I was forwarding that shell that was reversing back to my my Kali uh, machine that was on my, my internal network. How do I do that? That was what that video was all about. Well, he wanted to know, that would be Jacob, how do I know which, which payload to pick? If you're in, if you're in Metasploit, you know, there's there's a butt ton of payloads. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna mess around. There's there's a few. You hit that show payloads option, and you're gonna be like, whoa, which one of these? And if you're new to the game, and some of you are, as I like to say, we were all born noobs, right? Uh, nobody was born with this knowledge. Everyone was a noob at one point in time, so it's never a bad thing that you ask a question about something you're un unsure of or you haven't been able to find a sufficient answer. I'm gonna try to today help you uh, find some of those resources that will help you answer that, and I'm going to attempt to answer it as well using said resources. Now, when I say, have you seen that, that Metasploit payloads? Let me jump into my uh, thing here. I just did a show payloads. I know it's kind of it's kind of small. I'll, I'll zoom in a bit here in just a second. But I just uh, launched the Metasploit and hit show payloads. And here are the payloads. There are quite a few of them. As you can see, I'm still scrolling. Yeah, whoa, how many are there? And this is like an older version. I haven't even updated this in a hot minute. So it looks like 591. So... So near 600 payloads, we might even be over that at this point. You never know if they add more or take some away. It could be cold at some time. But right, right now, this version is, is right around 600 payloads. And that is a lot. That does, would make one wonder, which one of these do I actually use? And to answer that question, it's going to break down into a few different other questions. You have to figure out what you want to do. What are you trying to do with your Metasploit payload? And that is going to help you pick and choose the correct payload for your specific instance. So that's kind of how we go at this. We figure out what it is we want to do, and then we find the right payload that allows us to do exactly what it is. Now, sometimes that's going to be kind of pushed and pulled in certain directions due to the idea that maybe there are factors beyond our control that are going to... There's a plane flying over me right now. I'm, I'm in the flight path of our local airport uh, as I've recently moved. And now I get to enjoy planes flying over my house every day. Um, but back to the story. Because of certain things that happen here and there that you can't control, you might have to choose a different payload for different reasons. This is going to be things like firewalls or the size of the payload itself can only be of a certain amount because you only have enough room, especially if you're doing exploit development. So a lot of factors can come into play if or, or when you are choosing a payload. Okay, so those are some of the things that we need to keep in mind as we look through the different payloads. All right, let's get back on the computer screen. And to help answer this question, I have go back here uh, if I go to here this is offensive security also offensive security makes Kali Linux OSCP fame and fortune right uh, they have this wonderful resource called Metasploit Unleashed just do a Google search of Metasploit Unleashed first I guarantee uh, almost without fail it will be the first return uh, of offensive securities page and I just looked under the Metasploit fundamentals there is a whole section on payloads. 
Hey, that's what we're talking about today. It makes this easy. Payload types in the Metasploit framework, right? So we have things like uh, three main payload types of singles, stagers, and stages. Metasploit contains many different types of payloads, each serving a unique role within the framework. Take a brief look at the various types of payloads. So this is a great resource. You're not just for this. You want to know the ins and outs of Metasploit. And this, you, know, you could do worse than reading through this document or just using it as a reference. So we have an inline or non-staged payload, right? A single payload containing the exploit and full shell code for the selected task. Inline payloads by design are more stable than their counterparts because they contain everything all wrapped up into one, right? However, some exploits won't, su some exploits won't support the resulting size of these payloads. So remember, if you're building something or, or if you have some size limitations, uh, these inline or non-staged payloads might be too large when you generate them, okay? So just be aware of that. Then you have these staged payloads. So, so you got a stager, right? A stager payload works in conjunction with stage payloads in order to perform a specific task. So a stager establishes a communication channel between the attacker and the victim and then reads in a stage payload to execute the, on the remote host. So you basically have, with a stager or a stage payload, you have two different sides of the equation. You have the first part, the initial first stage, if you will, right? Uh, that when it gets executed, I'll bring it in here. When it gets executed, its job is to just create a communication channel between the target and you, the attacker. Perfect, right? Okay. Once that's established, now we're on to stage two. Stage two will be, we have a communication channel. Please, if you would, give me the the actual thing I want to do. So if this is going to be a bind shell, a reverse shell, or some other thing that you want to do, that's when that information actually gets passed from one device to the other, right? So there you go. That's what we mean by stage. And this... It can come in handy when its size limitations are an issue. So that initial stage one is usually pretty small because it doesn't have to do a whole lot, just as an opening communication channel and reach out and say, hey, give me the next piece. Then it can run anything that it needs, size be danged, and just do whatever you like, all right? Uh, and then let's go back. We have Meterpreter. So Meterpreter is uh, the short form of Meta Interpreter. It's an advanced, full-faceted payload that operates via DLL injection. The Meterpreter resides completely in memory of the remote host and leaves no trace on the hard drive, making it very difficult to detect with conventional forensic techniques. Scripts and plugins can be loaded and unloaded dynamically and require a Meterpreter development. And as required, and Meterpreter development is very strong and constantly evolving. La, the interpreter payloads are usually very helpful for this very reason. They work well. You can reestablish pretty easily. Um, they're very clean. Uh, they're nice. I'm not going to lie. Using them is great. So, you know, you're going to want to weigh the pros and cons of, of using that. Sometimes they work. Sometimes they don't. Interpreter payloads tend to get busted by antivirus and anti-malware systems pretty quickly. Um, let's do a lot of the other payloads, but the interpreter payloads specifically tend to tend to get popped. So there you go. That's some. There's other things in here as well. The passive X, the non X, but I'm the ORD IPv6 reflective deal. I'm not getting into all that. I'm just kind of giving you the, the the basics here, right? Because like you said, Jacob, you are new to the game. I don't want to overwhelm you with stuff. Now that said, let's jump back to these payload types. You're gonna notice. I'm gonna kind of uh, increase the font size here. It's gonna get a little weird, but I want, to, I want to make sure you can see. You'll notice that you have these things like payload CMD Unix by Netcat. Okay. Uh, what else do we have here? We have, we have, look at here, um, payload Apple iOS ARC64 interpreter reverse HTTPS. This is probably what Jacob was getting to when he was asking about this. So let's kind of break these things down. Obviously, it starts with payload. That means this is the type payload. So anything in here is going to be a payload that can, that might be able to be used. Not all payloads are usable for different uh, exploits in, Met in Metasploit. 
if you are generating them using something like MSF Venom, then go crazy, create anything you like. Then you have this right here, and this is gonna be kind of like system information. So I've got AIX, PPC, I've got Android. So I'll notice that this payload is specific, this payload, this payload is specifically for Android systems. And it is a interpreter type payload. And this is going to be a reverse HTTP. So it's going to create a reverse shell using HTTP. Making sense? And it's going to be for Android systems and using the type of interpreter. This, this hopefully is now making a little more sense to you to go, oh, I get it. So if, I have, if I'm targeting an Android device, right? And I want to use a interpreter so I can have a nice, clean, nice connection between myself and said Android device. Then maybe I want to use payload, payload, I did it again. Payload Android. Do not try to say those two things together three times fast. Um, interpreter to keep it nice and easy. Reconnection should be fairly simple and reverse HTTP. So I'm going to, I'm going to get a reverse shell over the HTTP protocol. That's how this is all going to work. If that's what you're looking for, then that would be what you would want to use, right? And if you'll see, we have other options as well. We have reverse HTTPS. We have reverse TCP, one that you might see quite often. Now, you'll notice it also comes down here and talks about Android interpreter, right? Android reverse HTTPS stager. And uh, so you can even see whether or not this is a staged or non-staged payload, right? It's all hopefully making sense to you at this point. After that, it's just picking the right thing, right? And that's where it kind of gets to like, we have 600 in which to choose. So you have to take all the factors into play. Am I targeting a Linux system? Is it a Windows system? Is it Apple? Is it Android? What is it? And then moving through. Now, most times you are looking for those reverse uh, shell type payloads. That's where your target will actually reach back and create a shell connection uh, and connect to your your attacking machine. There are also bind shells. Bind shells are where it opens up the possibility for you to connect to your target. So you make the connection instead of the, the target connecting back. Does that make sense? Hopefully it does. You choose one of the other based off of a couple of certain factors. Bind shells are nice, but a lot of times firewalls block them, right? So you just don't... you. The port you choose to connect with isn't open or won't allow that type of traffic or whatever the case is. So bind shells aren't typically used. Reverse shells are because egress traffic is less filtered than ingress traffic usually. What else do we have here? Um, of course, stagers or inlines. You can use any of those. Uh, oh, this is a good one. So execute a command, right? So this is payload in BSD x64 exec so it's not always hey pop a reverse shell and we need to take into account the architecture that it supports is it x64 or is it x32 right keep that in mind uh choose choose appropriately and then exec here is to say hey execute a command I actually did this in my last not this specific one but one for linux in my last episode which is left-handed. There, bam. I'm creating malware, and I used a interpreter payload. Was it, was it a interpreter? No, I don't think it was specifically a interpreter, but it was a Metasploit payload. There you go. Uh, and I used this exec command to fire off a string of commands that I wanted the machine to do. You could do that. Hey, do these things. Shells, bind, shell, reverse, so on and so forth. Execute a command. Uh, what else do we have? I know there's a couple other stuff in here. Like it will do specific commands, um, like create a create a user. I'm just kind of like it's hard to look at these. Reverse awk, reverse JJS, reverse Lua. Oh, that's kind of cool. It's it's talking about hey, let's create reverse shells using maybe different supported programming language. Like here's one using Perl. So if Perl's installed on the target machine. I think it needs to be installed. Uh, 
it will use Perl to create that connection. Uh, let's see here, there's Python. I know there's other stuff, like I said, there's do these specific things. That's mostly shells though. Debug trap, there's a custom payload, so if you need to make a custom payload. Um, let's see here. Oh, there we go. Linux add user. So payload, Linux, ARM, so ARM LE, um, then add user. So this was specifically for a Linux ARM LE system, create, or create a user on the system that you can now use. Again, there's an exec command right there. And that works. There's gonna be ones for Windows. You can kind of filter these out as you're looking, or if you are actually in Metasploit, uh, working with a specific type of um, exploit that is available, it will give you only the usable, uh, it'll only suggest you the, the usable payloads for that exploit. So if it's Windows based, it'll give you Windows based stuff. But there you go. That's what's going on. I'm trying to think if there's anything else that really needs to be pointed out here. Just what system you want to use, what architecture it's going to be on, whether or not it's going to be a interpreter payload or uh, something else, whether or not it's going to be inline or staged. So staged or not staged. These are the big ones. Like there's a chmod command, right? Uh, another add user for x86. Uh, that's chmod. There's the add user right there. Yeah, bada bing. These are the, the, the main, you know, bits and pieces to interpreter payloads. I'm sure there's other stuff, but I think that should be good for you. Hopefully it is. Get you going and make you help you understand what's going on payload wise when you're looking at all six, almost 600 payloads that are available to you in the uh, uh, Metasploit system, uh, the framework, I guess it is. So I hope that helps out, Jacob. I hope that helps other people out that might not understand the payloads in Metasploit. Give you a, a, a shed a little light on them for you. And now you can go forth. Create payloads to your heart's content. I don't know why I just became British. The horrible, horrible accent. It's like you know, the British accents I heard on TV as a kid. But that's it. Uh, thanks for watching, everyone. And don't forget to throw comments in the section that says comments because you never know when I'm going to be answering your comment right here on camera for you. So thanks for watching and keep hacking.